I'm a preservationist, a historic preservationist by, by, uh, by vocation. Um, and when I got it, when Mark asked me to give this talk about sort of what our office does with architecture in relation to not just landscape in the sense of lawns and whatnot, but how buildings relate to their environment. Um, it got me interested about looking historically at how American houses historically have, a, have, have decided to sit in their environments. And this, you can go all the way back to the 18th century, to the Georgian era, and, and, and see some interesting um, techniques and ideas which end up strangely being recycled. And you can see that, that, that what we think of as, as architecture and how it relates to landscape is not just a phenomenon of the present, present, but it is a phenomenon that is a culmination of 300 years of landscape idea and architecture as well. So I'll, I'll try to make it brief, but um, I am literally starting 300 years ago. Uh, and in the, in the 18th century, and this is Shirley Plantation, which is a, which is a Virginia James River plantation. It is a building which reacts to its environment in a very specific way, um, in, in a very formal way. It is not open to its environment. It has windows of a very regular pattern, and it has a double portico on both the front and the back because it's on the James River. And there was both the land side and there was the, well, the river side as well. And so it presented an equal face to both. Within this, if you look at this site, this sort of aerial, you can see that the arrangement of the architecture was actually a, a, not just about the house itself, but it was about the dependencies and the other buildings that were related to create a very sort of formal landscape, which defined a sort of precinct in the middle, which was uh, defined by the edge of the buildings that were around it, and then this kind of working landscape that was around the outside. So you might envision in the middle here, we have this formal relationship with these buildings. You might have a uh, a higher level of, of finish, a higher level of, uh, of refinement. And then outside of that, in the working landscape, it, it smells, it's dirty, and it's a working plantation. Uh, this was very true of many of these plantations of the, uh, of the 18th century. This is uh, uh, Stratford Hall, which is Robert E. Lee's ancestral home. You can see that the house is H-shaped. It sits in the middle of this landscape with the Potomac River to the north and the river road to the south. The, there, is, there are vistas. The house does, again, it's a very formal box. It does not have porches. It does not have elements that, uh, uh, that open itself out into the landscape. It has stairs on the side and formal entry stairs on the front and the back. But what you do have on the side is, are boxwood parterres, orchards, geometric, rectilinear, uh, uh, regularized forms which are the, the landscape which was intended for visitors to see. Uh, what went on down here where the slave quarters were and those things was a whole, whole different ball of wax. This idea of this formality of the building being not necessarily a, 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 a machine which focuses you on the landscape, but more a sculptural element or, or, or an object in a landscape which is meant to be viewed from different vistas is something that persisted well into the 19th century. You see it in Greek revival houses uh, uh, in the 19th century uh, up until, um, really, until the 1840s and 1850s. What's interesting is that not all plantation houses uh, followed this, the, the, that, that kind of hemmed-in, boxy quality. And it's interesting to look at French colonial architecture in Louisiana. This is Parlange Plantation, built in 1750. And because of this kind of miasmic environment of, of Louisiana, the, the sort of warm air, the humidity, uh, the flat uh, land. The French developed this sort of elevated raised basement plantation type house, which uh, opened itself into the, to its environment. The, 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 the roof formed this kind of sheltering hat-like roof with a gallery that wraps all the way around the house, supported on these little colonnettes, and then French doors, not just windows, but French doors on every exterior opening. No interior stair. You go out onto the porch or the gallery to go down to the floor below. It's elevating the living floor to where the breeze is. Uh, so there can, you can get a little bit of, 
ventilation, a little bit of relief from the heat. Now, the really smart people were down in the basement, which is a brick basement. And you know how a, a, a brick first floor will retain heat or cold depending on what the temperature is outside. There's a thermal lag with thick masonry. And so the, the ground floor, which was really a utility floor, was where the kitchen, the, not the kitchen, where things would be stored, uh, where you'd have a, a meat stored or you ha you'd have the wine cellar. And there was actually even in some versions of this, uh, this type of house, there'd be a dining room down on the first floor as well. So it was just that much more comfortable. But again, this is a, a, a house which, in a very different way than the English tradition of the period, uh, opens itself much more fully to the environment and is much more reactive to the actual uh, uh, climate that it's built in. Uh, so the Virginians and even the Georgians at the time still had a very sort of formal and restrained kind of hemmed in boxy like quality, whereas this uh, is in some ways much more reflective of the way we live today, the way our architecture reacts to the environment today. Are you saying that they could not go from one floor to the other without coming outside? Yes, that's right. And that's, that's not universal, it's, and, and this is the formal sort of entry stair. But if you look at the floor plan on the back side, there's another stair, which is the service stair, which is there's no internal, there's no hallway. There's not, the, all the rooms open to each other, so you get cross ventilation, and the stair is outside. There is an example in Georgia, which I did not put on this show. Uh, it's a Greek revival plantation house, plantation house called Wood, Woods Plantation in Wilkes County. I have no idea if this house still exists. Uh, it has a, it is a dog trot Georgian, uh, uh, it, is a, it is a glorified dog trot Greek revival house with a big uh, breezeway that runs right through the middle of the house and the stair between the floors is in that breezeway. Uh, and it's the strangest house of that period that I've ever seen, but uh, brilliant in terms of allowing ventilation through the house. Uh, so yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> it was a very different time. You know, this is a, a 19th century. This is a, a, a Oak Alley plantation uh, in Louisiana. This is in the Greek Revival uh, our style, um, but it reacts to its to its landscape. It reacts to its environment much more similarly to the in the French tradition with this kind of openness. These houses with this colonnade on three or four sides appears in Georgia as well in the same period. You have things in Georgia in the 1830s. Uh, if you know the, the Cow's Bond Woodruff House in Macon that sits up on the hill above Macon, beautiful colonnade on all sides, uh, big windows to allow convective currents to move through the house, and so on. It does not have this lovely oak LA, not, not, a, not an element of, of many Georgia landscapes, but there are some examples of it down on the coast. The retreat plantation on St. Simons, you may know, uh, which is now a golf club or something that I am not a member of, uh, that that uh, uh, had a beautiful live oak LA. What's really interesting is that in the, in the 1840s, the, there was a beginning of a change of, of American domestic architecture that moved away from these boxy symmetrical forms. This is a publication called um, Cottage Residences by Andrew Jackson Downing and we, in partnership with Alexander Jackson Davis. So A.J. Downing and A.J. Davis partnered to design houses in a kind of idealized picturesque landscape, which th this diagram right here has probably had more influence on what American landscape architecture and American domestic architecture has become than almost anything that has come since in a lot of ways. And it really, I'll read my notes so I get it right, but th the philosophy was this. The design, the design of these houses uses, used porches as transitions between interiors and landscape. You have the house opening itself up to the landscape. The designs emphasize curvilinear naturalistic paths, the creation of vistas, and the perfection of existing landscape features. The residential design should emphasize utility and beauty. Perfect architecture is both useful and beautiful and each is ennobled by the influence of the other. Um, and so this is the, the beginning of that marriage between what, how a house uh, uh, exists in its environment, but not as an object only in the landscape, but as a, as a living, not a mechanism, but, but a, a space to be inhabited, which opens out into its environment as well. Now, I was just in Augusta a, a month ago 
for the Georgia Trust Ramble. And I don't know if any of you went to that, but there's a house on, on, in Summer, uh, Somerville up on the hill, which was built in 1861 uh, 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 by the landscape architect who did Fruitlands, whose name is now escaping me. Um, oh, God. It's an interesting house because it's a, it's a Gothic revival house. No. Oh, God. This is what happens to my brain these days. I'll remember it uh, six hours from now. Anyway, he, 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 the Fruitlands Nursery, which is now the, uh, is now the Augusta National Golf Club's head, uh, not headquarters, their clubhouse, was built by um, uh, this guy whose name I can't remember, but later he built a house on the hill. It's a Gothic Revival house, beautiful, interesting cottage, but the way it relates, it's set up high on a vista overlooking Augusta in the distance. A terrace, he, he hand terraced the hillside to create a location for his specimen planting so he could continue the kind of investigation that he was doing um, with Fruitland's Nursery, which was, was uh, um, uh, down, as you know, if you know Augusta, it's down the hill. Um, but he was really uh, an innovator of bringing in um, uh, other uh, orchard species that were unusual for the time and really populating a lot of antebellum gardens with uh, interesting species that had not been seen in Georgia um, up to that point. Uh, and he sold that to the Berkmans who have ultimately developed and propagated many, many more species and created some of the, I'm not a, a horticulturist or a landscape architect, so I do not know what I'm talking about, but they did a lot of plants that actually became the basis of a lot of, of old Southern gardens in the period. And this was all in the 18, 1840s and 50s, so a long time ago. So. My point here with this slide is really that you get these, these picturesque little cottage forms. They're asymmetrical. They have towers, they have turrets, they have porches, they have loges. They have elements which, which open the interior to the exterior and create interesting relationships between parts of the house. And then you have those set into a landscape which is idealized for the placement of that house. And it hides, it, it, there's a sort of you know, uh, uh, crop row crop gardens as part of this idea. This is a utilitarian idea. But really what, what Americans really uh, uh, were, were captured by was this, this curvilinear uh, house in an idealized landscape, as I would say. it. That idea also we see today in the idea of the estate lot development. Because this is 1853. It doesn't look like much, but what it is is a, is a planned suburban development called, Llewell, or, or called uh, Llewellyn Park, 11 miles west of New York City in New Jersey, at the foot of uh, some the Wachung Mountains, I believe. Curvilinear uh, roads, I think you probably are familiar with those. Watercourses, uh, uh, connected green space with watercourses running through it. Have any of you been to Ansley Park in Atlanta? Probably. 1904, well, the precedent for that was set in 1853. This, this idea of, of houses set in these you know, five to 10 acre lots in with, with a curvilinear approaches, these, these lovely uh, green vistas through, uh, uh, th through the development uh, really uh, is something that Americans embraced in the architecture. Um, there are many examples of planned communities from this point all the way into the early 20th century that use that idea of common green space. And in a way, what's interesting about it is that accessibility of common green space affected the houses more than you would think. It wasn't that architecture developed sort of independently. Uh, in many ways it did, but, but sensitive architecture developed in conjunction with the availability of access to landscape, which is a really interesting idea. Um, and then the ideas of Olmsted and Vox, who doesn't get enough credit for his, his uh, uh, contributions to the works of Olmsted and Vox, but Central Park first, and then this is Prospect Park. Prospect Park was the second of the great New York City parks, but this idea, this accessibility of this type of landscape and this variety of landscape affected what Americans expected in their domestic residences, that's redundant, but in their residences uh, for uh, uh, by, by their avail, avail, 
by the availability of these kinds of in, uh, environments to inhabit. So there's a, the, the three parts of Prospect Park, just for your edification. There's the long meadow here, which was uh, uh, a, a long vista with undulating grassy, uh, uh, not hills so much as it's, uh, you can better describe it than I can, so I'm not going to try to. There's a wooded center part. This is on a ridge, a rise, uh, uh, that was one of the last old growth forests in New York City. Still there, uh, but, a, but there's a wooded portion. And then an absolutely artificial lake, which you would not know in a million years was artificial, but it's fed by the Croton Aqueduct system that comes from the Catskill Mountains 100 miles away. But there was no, no lake there. It was dug, and the water was provided through the municipal water supply. But now it's grown into become, uh, uh, you know, the backyard of most New Yorkers, or at least New Yorkers who live in the proximity, Brooklynites, really, because they would be offended to call them New Yorkers first. But nevertheless, um, this idea, this, th th this variety, um, I think, had a, had a significant impact on American landscape. Uh, Olana. This is Frederick Edwin Church, you know, the Hudson School River painter. He was sort of the dean of the Hudson River School. He built this exotic, in this period there, this is in the 1870s, uh, uh, an embrace of exoticism. He had traveled to North Africa and to Persia, came back and built a house on the top of a, of a mountain, basically, with a, a, a quaint little view down the Hudson Valley, which he, which he painted. It became a subject, the house the vista became the subject of his own paintings, this winter at Olana, the view from Olana in the snow. Um, the house being non-boxy, non-rectilinear, not, not hemmed in, has all kinds of, of different abilities to, uh, to see and to frame the landscape and the scenery around it. You have the recessed loggia up above, you have these bays, uh, and the exotic architecture just adds to the kind of spicy flair of the, and, and this is both interior and exterior in this place. It's not, it was not just surface veneer. He went all in in this house with uh, uh, painted surfaces on all, in all uh, ways. In the later 19th century, plan book houses, and this is in, into the sort of firmly what we would call Victorian. This is stick style, but then the Queen Anne to follow, like the Beef Dickey house in Inman Park. It's really interesting to look at these, these pattern books. You know, this is a plan book of the day. You could go, you could buy it, and you could, it had plans in it. You could build the house based on the plans. But to look at how they, how the architects, not the landscape architects, how the architects have envisioned what landscape is. And I, 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 this is the earliest example I'm going to show you, but um, there's a lawn. There's curving uh, pathways. There's a little... Uh, eddy of plantings of some kind, and trees on the side, uh, I think providing similar geometry to the tall tower uh, in front. When you get into the, into the 20th century, especially in the craftsman era, even small houses start to open themselves to the landscape in myriad ways, incorporating outdoor spaces, porches, uh, patios, and in, in, in the way that the greenery is shown on this one on the left in particular, actually going up onto the house, the house becomes subsumed in some ways to the landscape by, by vines and, and uh, uh, vegetation. So there's a blurring of the lines between inside and outside. We, we have so many of these craftsman houses still in neighborhoods all over Georgia. And to look at, at, at the ways that they, they were intended to integrate into their environment versus uh, kind of sit in a lonely patch of grass like many of them do now um, is a really interesting thing to see. Colonial revivals, boxy, closed off in a lot of ways. Uh, and you see this, you know, in the early 20th century, uh, all that stuff, not the organic stuff, but whatever the really toxic stuff, if there is any over there, that's when uh, better living through chemistry really came to the fore in, uh, in lawn maintenance uh, uh, and, and the I idealization, the fetishization of the perfect lawn. That, it doesn't date just back to the early 20th century. You can go all the way back to the 19th century. But the fact that, that there were the, the chemical advances to have 
weed killers and all of that is something that's a relatively more recent phenomenon. Um, and so lawns become this sort of ubiquitous front doormat uh, in these houses with what I would call a pretty perfunctory landscape idea around the house. You've got some bushes, landscape plantings, some trees in the background. There's always trees in the background, but they never move into the foreground at all in any of these houses. Uh, here in this little minimal traditional, same thing. We'll throw some bushes on either side of the front door, and then we'll show some nice trees in the distance on somebody else's property that's not yours, because your house is too small. Um, ag again, some interesting ideas, Dutch colonial revival house on the cover of American Builder magazine with this, uh, with the, the, with this, some magical flowering vine of multiple colors, which has climbed up onto the house and, and is, you know, it's, it's idealized. Certainly there's your Italian cedar, I guess, Cypress, not cedar, sorry. <laughs> in, so the, the, you know, there's a variety of, of architectural styles in the early 20th century. Uh, a lot of revivals, um, but they have, you know, all of these have a relative consistent treatment of a lawn. It's the front front doormat, and then some foundation plantings, and that stuck with us for a very long time. I'm going to skip my um, diatribe about Frank Lloyd Wright, but I'll st I will pause on this for a second because in the 1930s, when Wright did Falling Water, it's a complete departure from so much of what we have just seen. These kind of houses for normal people. This is not a house for a normal person. But, but it's, in every way, it's a reaction to its environment. And so we're not talk, really talking about gardening and landscape anymore. We're talking about the sort of milieu of a, of a, uh, 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 of a semi-Appalachian forest with a stream running down it. And in every way, this house, it reflects both the geology and the geometry of, of the site that it's on. The siting alone is absolutely brilliant. I mean, as bad a person as Frank Lloyd Wright was, that is, that is one of the finest residences that's ever been built in the United States, and that's without a, without a doubt. And it shows this sort of capacity for genius. Um, but it, it, in a way, it grows organically out of its landscape. All of the stone was quarried on site. It's as though this geometry is, has become animated to create these big stone anchors. And the, and the house, if you've ever, I'm sure many of you have been to it, the way that it hovers over the stream, it's not, it's not looking at the stream, it's, it's co-opting the stream. It's co-opting what what the, the flow of water below it. And there's a really interesting experience there where you're both, you're, the vistas of this green canopy is framed by the steel windows, but you go out onto these, out onto these terraces and the white noise, the sound of the water going by, you don't realize it's immediately below you. And there's this kind of overwhelming sense of, of that sound, of that whooshing water that is unlike, probably unlike any other experience I've ever had. There's some absolutely miserable parts of this house. And Wright was, if nothing, a psychological manipulator of space. And he would squeeze you through these tiny little spaces. And then, and then you would emerge into nirvana in some ways. And it was him just playing with you. And he was, he was an, you know, that kind of egotist, but you gotta forgive him for these moments of, you know, absolute uh, lucid genius. Con contrast that to the modernists, Meese and Philip Johnson, who designed these, the Glass House and the Farnsworth House. It, it, this is, it tells you everything that you ever wanna know about how modernists dealt with landscape, which is by denying it exists. And, and you have me on the Farnsworth house setting a sculptural object in nature, but really at an arm's length. It's six feet above the ground because the river that it sits in front of floods. And the big problem now is that the flooding has flooded about halfway up the, the cabinetry inside. And you, you know the solution is that they're gonna make this, they're gonna, they're, the, the house will at a push of a button elevate itself above the flood or so the National Trust is going to spend millions of dollars to create a, a mechanism below this house that will raise it up. The, the, you know, the, the Bombay doors will open up and the elevator will lift the house out so that it doesn't flood anymore. Which is kind of typical of, you know, this, we, this is my, this is my, my creation. I am setting it, I'm, I'm, I deign to set it into this dirty, 
uh, natural thing where th where things like rain and dirt get on it. Uh, but he but he did it. The the the, the reaction to the landscape uh, it, it doesn't it. What am I trying to say? You, you have you have a, a a porch. We'll call it a porch, which is simply the absence of glass around. And then there's a lower terrace you go down, and that is also above the ground. And so you're every the way that you as a as a person living in this house uh, would really rarely would touch the ground. You would rarely have your feet in the grass. Um, you have this unlimited panoramic view of the river and the forest around you. He's sort of capturing that, but he's, he's sort of keeping you separate from it. And Philip Johnson's sort of similar reaction to the glass house is different. It sits down on the ground, but effectively what it is is a mechanism to frame the, a landscape, to, to suck the soul out of the landscape and say, here's, you know, we're, we're, we have the power to see and enjoy this, uh, and you can see me gallivanting naked in my house if you want to, uh, but, but it's not really, there's nothing organic and there's nothing, uh, there's actually no opening on the back side of the house. There's no, it, even though it is on the ground, you cannot go outside directly. You have to go back out the front door and then around. And so it's, it's, it's uh, a, a little bit of a, um, it it's simply serves, the frame of the house simply serves to it. To, to frame a landscape, uh, which is an interesting idea. You get a, in something like Neutra's uh, Kaufman House in Palm Springs, you get a combination of both of these things, the artificiality of sort of the, the, the modern detachment from environment and landscape, but Neutra was actually a relatively accomplished landscape designer as well. And here you have the epitome of what you would sort of call California modern, um, so the, the landscape design con contrasts with the, the natural with the highly artificial. At the edges of his landscape, Neutra amassed rocks, native grasses, and succulents. Yet then he lays down a perfect carpet of grass in the immediate vicinity of the house. His swimming pool is not arbitrarily located, but its placement balances out the other arms of his pinwheel plan. So if you look at this plan, it really serves as a series of walls that that uh, back up rooms and support roofs. But the front side of every one of these arms is fully open to the environment. So it's like me standing here looking out. I have something solid behind me and a roof over my head, but then I have this unlimited view. It's a really interesting idea uh, of this, I mean, ridiculously perfect green lawn with a few boulders placed strategically for effect, but then a relatively native environment around it. But this grass contrasting with the desert mountain landscape reveals the kind of artificiality of the idea and how much water is expended to do this. Um, I, I don't know if you know these houses. Any of you are familiar with these Eichler houses in California? Eichler was a, was a massive home builder on the scale of the Levitts in the, in the east. They built 11,000 homes in California between 1949 and 1966. And the, and the basic design was really interesting because uh, it was the, the, the house from the street. Here you can actually sense where the entry is, but we get the garage door pushed into the front, which is an unfortunate phenomenon that persists to this day. But once you go through this space, you're actually not in the house. What appears to be the front door is actually not the front door you're entering into a courtyard space called the atrium, never to be called anything else, because any Eichler person will correct you immediately and tell you you're an idiot for calling it anything but the atrium. It's not a courtyard, it's not a garden, it's the atrium. But it's an open top space, it's surrounded by the building that you go through to actually get into the house. And so the house is, turns its back effectively to everything around it. It's relatively unglazed, unfenestrated around the edge because all of the rooms open fully into this kind of uh, interior courtyard, which is where you have a kind of protected uh, environment. I suppose you grow your citrus there. It's very much like what would happen in, say, Baghdad or, or in a desert environment, which is perfectly suited for, because you create this microclimate in the middle of the architecture that allows you to, um, to cultivate precious things that otherwise wouldn't make it outside of that landscape or outside of that, that architecture. 
in the in the Levitts or the other the other big builder, they built I think 17,000. This is uh, Levitt, Levittown, New York, the first of the Levittowns. 17,441 homes built between 1947 and 1951. This was assembly line house construction. And the, the plans that they derived, they would change every year like car models. So you would, you know, you, now you can get the new rancher, the 1941 or 1951 rancher. Um, you can see it's interesting to look at sort of how, it's like our uh, landscape has, has distilled down into the kind of banal suburban ranchy environment that I think we're all familiar with because uh, that's what was, it wasn't really about that. It wasn't really about nice landscape. Uh, it was about moving houses and getting people in. Um, but then I'm jumping way ahead to the late 70s with seaside, new urbanism, reacting to the excesses of modernism by creating, it's, it's effectively a repudiation of what the traditional models were for suburban development. There was communal access to the natural amenities, which, were the, which would be the beach. Um, there was connection of green space, which is really interesting. So you're not just dealing with your own lot, but there's, because of the retention of existing and native plantings, uh, there was a connected, in, effectively you're building houses within a connected environment. Um, and what, uh, th but that actually is really interesting because that, that was referring back to some house plans from the 1920s, not house plans, city plans. There were uh, designers in New York, Clarence Stein and Henry Wright, who designed a few um, interesting developments that had communal green space as the kind of linkage between uh, uh, planned, uh, planned communities. Um, and so this is actually going back to the, some of the planning ideals of the early 20th century uh, in a really interesting way. But um, at Seaside, like I said, there was retention of natural vegetation, an informal landscape as well. And then the architecture, the, it has a, it's a picturesque traditional architecture that includes porches, ver verandas, belvederes, et cetera. So all that Victorian knickknacks that we saw a little while ago was brought back into this neo-traditional architecture which had the which which offered that openness to the landscape around and it was in because of the density of the houses that were being built at seaside it's also a little voyeuristic exercise of like i can sit on my rooftop load or my my rooftop belvedere and look at my neighbors sitting on their porches and there's it but in a way that develops a sense of community which is interesting uh, neighborhoods that are relatively dense and open to each other when you have porches that line up or you have uh, okay, uh, there, you know, it sort of forces, in a way it encourages, not forces, but it encourages interaction between neighbors, which is, uh, I think, a good thing, a really good thing. So I'm going to just quickly talk about what we do. Um, I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a preservationist, so I deal with a lot of historic houses and old houses. Um, my partners are modernists, and they design houses which uh, react in a very interesting way to the environment. This happens to be one of mine. Um, but in this case, because architecture today is, has broken completely from the boxy form with just windows and a door, and a for, the formality of, our, of domestic architecture has really gone out the window. A lot of, in a lot of ways, the, um, the composition of a facade of a, of a building has, every, has mu as much to do with the interior function as it does with the exterior views. And you think, contrast that to a Greek revival house, which would have very regular window patterns all the way around, regardless of the function. And all those windows would be the same size. In the early 20th century, you start to see kitchen windows and bathroom windows shrink up. But before that, that was almost unheard of until those eclectic styles uh, of the 19th century, you would see that as well. Architecture today, a lot of those rules have just gone out the window. So you, your, your patterns of windows and your openings can be whatever they need to be to react to the environment. So this was a case where our client came to us and said, I love this rock face. There's a stream running at the base of the rock face. How do you react to it? And we created this, uh, what I think is a lovely screen porch with a, with a, uh, uh, with a wood stove with a roof line that opens up to kind of 
uh, a widen your view out, but it also allows this kind of panoramic sweep. Now, interestingly, if you look at the corners here, there's a little tiny post at the corner, not a big post, which is inset. So by opening that corner a little bit more, it, it, helps, it helps sort of guide your eye around and sweep around instead of, instead of defining the sort of limits blinkering your vision. Um, from the outside, you know, this is little, a little bit like a duck's beak, but uh, that opens to, the, to, the, uh, to the, the rock face. But if you look at the fenestration here, the, the openings, there's a vertical stripe of glass and there's a horizontal stripe of glass. And these are focused to, on specific elements of the landscape as well, to frame specific elements of the landscape. This is, this is elevated and actually cantilevers out over the, port, over the stream a little bit, whereas this porch kind of spills down into the landscape in a natural way. And it has a lovely dry stack stone wall, um, which is a little bit like the inverse of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, if you know what I'm talking about, where it's, it's heavy at the corner and then it tapers to the edge. But it creates this kind of domestic, this uh, I'll call it a little bit more civilized landscape here. And then it, it, it transitions into forest land, which is all around it. So this is a house set in the woods. And it's very much of that. But I love the idea of sort of pushing the forest back just enough to create a, a little bit of domestic bliss there in the middle. But also for a secondary reason, which is there's a whole solar array on the roof. So this provides almost all the power for the house. Just on there, that's eight, eight and a half uh, kilowatts Megawatts, whatever it is. It's in Woodstock, New York, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. This is not one of our projects, but I did want to point out, you know, there's been a real embrace of the idea of, this, of the green roof. So landscape and green space is, is not just the ground anymore, but especially in cities uh, where a lot of larger cities have created ordinances. I think in New York now, you're actually required to have a green roof on any new construction. Uh, and so that, th this is a, a strange lawn-like feature on the roof, but it can be sedum, it can be planting small things, meadow gr grasses, I suppose. Tell me if I'm way off there. Um, but, but the idea that you can activate roof spaces that would have otherwise either just been hardscape or just left as roofs is a, is a really lovely idea, that it's being more widely embraced. It has huge benefits as far as the performance of the building as well. You can, it optimizes the outdoor space, but it reduces your heating and cooling loads as well, because effectively it acts like a big insulator on that roof. Um, and it also reduces the runoff. So it absorbs that, that moisture uh, and keeps it on, in the footprint of the building instead of creating a kind of shadow of, of the, the rain that would simply be um, then cast off into the environment. A lot of those, those runoff issues that I think that you're seeing potentially could be solved with some kind of uh, 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 green roof. There's also the, the, there are technologies of openings of doors that can be retracted fully to basically remove a wall from existence and, and have your outdoor, embrace of outdoor to indoor space, bringing outside inside. Um, and it also, it's a really interesting thing is that it forces you to not rely on your AC system as much. Because when you open up half of your house, you got to turn the AC off. And, and when you, you know, it was 96 degrees today. It's hot by any measure. But when it's a little bit cooler, uh, you know, it's, I think what we react to as human beings is, the, is going from, uh, 72 degrees inside to 92 degrees outside. It's that, that shock going back and forth. But I had a really interesting experience in, on the coast of North Carolina in the Outer Banks. Rented an old house for a week that had no AC. Had a lot of screen doors and a lot of screen porches. So the sea breeze and just getting acclimated to the temperature was like, oh my God, do we really need AC at all? Now that's a limited case. It's hot out here, it would be miserable. I agree. But the ability to, to acclimate to natural ventilation instead of artificial mechanical systems, it's a change in the way that we live. It's a change in the way we think about the way we should live 
saves a lot of energy and so on. I'm almost done, Mark. I hope I'm okay. Good. Okay, I see you standing up there. No, it's great. Okay. Also, even in modern architecture, screen porches, again, bringing the outdoor in and allowing that natural ventilation through is a really significant part. But what's really cool is you can take something like a kitchen and you can extend the kitchen out. So the outdoor space becomes sort of equivalent to the indoor space, and you could do both functions. It encourages the movement. This is no longer a sort of barrier between the inside and the outside. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a, an opening between two different activities that happen adjacent to each other. And what, my, uh, the, uh, what we like to do, too, is the, the landscape doesn't start at the front, front step. The, the, the architecture can extend into the landscape with the geometry of the pavers, using non-traditional plantings to minimize the water use um, and, uh, uh, and use retaining and so on to be able to site a house for a difficult site. This is on Pulaski here in town, and the site really drops away. So there's a really interesting uh, uh, arrangement of retaining walls with stepped plantings that go down to the lower level. Uh, and it creates a very easily accessible front entrance from this spot here into the front of the house. So increased accessibility and aging in place is a, is a big concern of architecture today because a lot of people, um, most people want a bedroom on the first floor now, master bedroom on the first floor. So how can you accommodate that? In a house like this, it doesn't have to be on the lower level. It can be on the upper level, uh, and you still have a, a bedroom that you can use for a very long time. Also, orientation of houses to optimize seasonal solar orientation. So high sun angles in the summer versus low sun angles in the winter means that you can use both deciduous vegetation around the house to block summer sun, but also deep overhangs and shading devices on the south side of the house can block the sun during the summer if it's coming in at a high angle but it allows winter light to come into the house and warm the interior because it's coming in at a lower angle. Um, and then having that much glass on the outside of a house opens it out to the, to the views. In large ways and small, you get the sweep, but also there are these smaller focus views in bedrooms of just maybe a treetop or just greenery beyond. It doesn't have to be a sort of big formal gesture. There can be little views uh, that are equally sort of poignant and beautiful. And then simplified accessibility to both inside and outside. So you either walk off out the back door to the landscape or the front door for that matter, or it's just a few, step down, a few steps down. So there's the, the, the porch becomes sort of dematerialized in a way that it doesn't feel like you're going off the porch. You're just sort of migrating out into what is your outdoor room. As the 72% of millennials, this is you know, just another room. And here, and specifically, this is, a, you know, this is a fully open dining area out here with a roof over it, so it can be used in all weather. But it's, it's very much it's a like a tongue of the house that's kind of extending itself out into the, out of the, into the environment, uh, and it allows that use to extend uh, uh, much, much more. So these are my big points. Um, we are, you see a lot of recycling of tried and true co concepts. But also, we're addressing environmental concerns in, in the architecture and domestic architecture and the reaction of architecture to landscape. So use, planning the reduction of water use, optimizing the orientation of a house for solar, uh, and then minimizing maintenance, reducing water uh, that needs to be used for irrigation, reducing chemicals, using native species, xeriscopic, xeriscopic whatever the word is, uh, uh, plantings that use very little water, um, and then increasing accessibility so folks can use the building for a very long time, uh, a life cycle. And then connecting green spaces is, I think, significant as well. So you don't think about your plot of land as being uh, an island, but it's actually part of an ecosystem, um, which you can exploit in many ways. Uh, so the deer can migrate through and eat your plants like they do at my house. Um, but that's a very jumbled, brief overview of 300 years of domestic architecture and landscape, and I hope it was uh, enjoyable. So thank you. Thank you.